Assalamualaikum. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is my lecture eight of um, organometallic chemistry, CHM six seven six. So uh, we have uh, do dealt, dealt with uh, how to use infrared spectroscopy, NMR spectroscopy to um, identify or to characterize organometallic compounds. And uh, I've gone through some practice exercises with you um, previously. So we are going on to the next uh, topic in organometallic chemistry. I'm going to go through compounds of metal to carbon sigma bond. And uh, this is in my recorded lecture eight. As you can um, recall, As you can recall, um, organometallic, compo or organometallic compounds are compounds containing metal to carbon bonds. You have encountered metal uh, carbonyls, you have encountered metal olefins, and now we are going to go into metal bonded to organic compounds through sigma bond only. Yeah. So organic compounds that are capable of making sigma bonds with metal centers are alkyls, for example, methyl, ethyl, propyl, um, as well as aryls. Aryls are aromatic. Aromatic that are bonded directly to only one carbon in that ring. Unlike olefin. Olefin, you have uh, the... Mm, metal bonded to the pi conjugate the pi uh, electrons but here in aryls you have the metal making a direct bond to a benzene ring for example phenyl i'm going to give an example later and another group of organo organic compounds that can make a sigma bond with metal is acyl acyl is when you have c double bond o and uh, any alkyl. So those are acyls. So you have um, alkyls, aryls, and acyls. So I'm going to first go through uh, some unique properties of metal alkyl complexes. Oh, um, so alkyls can be made up of an infinite number of compounds. You have methyl, you have um, ethyl, propyl, benzyl, nobonyl, and so on. But um, I'm going to uh, go through two very distinct uh, types of alkyls here, where the first type is the one with no uh, beta hydrogens. So what are beta hydrogens? Now, beta hydrogens are hydrogen bonded to the beta carbon of your... Um, organic ligand. So if you take this, for example, as your point of attachment, yeah, um, point of, this is, if you take this as your metal, metal attach from here to this carbon, so metal, the, the carbon next to the metal is the alpha carbon. And metal next to the alpha carbon is the beta carbon. So methyl doesn't have a beta carbon. So consequently, methyl doesn't have a, a beta hydrogen because beta hydrogens are hydrogens that are attached to the beta carbon. So methyl doesn't have any beta carbon, hence no beta hydrogen. Now, benzyl, as if you take this as um, the second example, you have metal here. The metal is attached to this alpha carbon, and this alpha carbon is attached to this beta carbon. There is a beta carbon here, but this beta carbon doesn't have any um, hydrogen attached to it. So this ben benzyl also doesn't have any beta hydrogen. Similarly, for this, no bonyl, one no bonyl. 
or neopental. This is another example. If metal is here, this is your alpha carbon, that is your beta carbon. On the beta carbon, there is no direct hydrogen bonded to it, so neopental also doesn't have any beta hydrogen, despite having beta carbon. Similarly, with this uh, trimethyl, silyl, methyl, if metal is here, this is your alpha position, this is your beta position, and silicon happens to be in the beta position and no hydrogen is attached to that silicon. So one, two, these five examples do not have any beta hydrogen in the structure. So that is the type that I'm going to discuss first, which is uh, alkyls which do not possess any beta hydrogen. They can make stable complexes with transition metals. So any organic ligands that do not possess any beta hydrogens can form stable complexes with transition metals. And why is that? To understand that, let's go through what happens if we have a beta hydrogen. For example, in um, ethyl, ethyl. So you have CH2, CH3, so that is ethyl. That is the metal. That is your alpha carbon. That is your beta carbon. And on the beta carbon, there are three hydrogens attached to it. One, two, and three, and all these three are called beta hydrogens. Now, beta hydrogens have the correct um, position to interact with the metal. Yeah. The reason for instability of transition metal alkyls usually arises from the decomposition of complex through what's called beta hydride elimination, forming an uh, hydride olefin intermediate as shown below. Yeah. So this uh, hydrogen attached to the beta carbon has the correct distance from this metal. Remember that this is a very floppy um, alkyl chain. It can, it can wag, it can go to the top, it can go to the bottom. And when it moves, when it wags like a, a cat's tail, you have this hydride, hydrogen here, to sufficiently be close to metal. And as a result, there is an interaction between the metal, the, the metal with the hydride, the beta hydride, through the um, nucleophilic uh, attack. So the electrons from that will attack the metal and the metal uh, subsequently will complete the movement of electron to transfer from this bond to that bond. So through that um, mechanism of electron transfer, you have this becomes a C double bond. C double bond C like this, and that becomes an olefin. If you can, re if you can uh, recognize this as ethene, an olefin. This is the transition state. Yeah, the transition state. You have ethene, and then the uh, pi electrons of that ethene is going to be donated to the metal, just like any olefin would do. And then this is not going to be a very stable uh, transition state where in the end, the ethene is going to be detached from this metal, making uh, MH being left behind. And this detachment is decomposition of your metal alkyl, metal uh, ethyl, metal, ethyl attached to metal. So the this is not going to be a very stable uh, situation, and the instability is because of the existence of the beta hydride there, making this transition metal 
and then making that will make the decomposition. Yep, the olefin can be eliminated, whereas hydrogen remains bonded to the metal, leaving behind the metal hydride. Therefore, alkyls with beta hydrides tend to produce unstable complexes with transition metals. That is why alkyls without any beta hydrogens are stable when they make complexes with transition metals. And the examples of those stable um, metal alkyls are metal attached to methyl, metal attached to benzyl, nobonal, neopentyl, TMSM. This is trimethyl, silyl methyl. This is such a huge ligand. Similarly, this is also quite a huge ligand. So you have... Um, now, so now you understand how um, uh, metal alkyls can be either stable or unstable through this uh, beta hydride elimination mechanism for the decomposition of that metal alkyl. So similar thing can happen when you have aryl. Oh no, no, when you have, um, yeah, when you have this situation, this metal attached to this oxygen which is in the alpha position and the carbon which is in the beta position and the carbon here has hydrogen attached to it so this is uh, beta hydrogen and the same mechanism of uh, initiation for decomposition can be in, uh, can be observed where this hydride is going to interact with the metal and the metal is in uh, it's in turn going to collapse this bond making that situation and in the uh, in the end there is uh, an aldehyde uh, being removed from that situation from this uh, compound aldehyde is removed from that compound decomposition of that compound will again be affected by the removal of this leaving behind your metal hydride yeah so this situation where the existence of beta hydrogens that beta hydrogen that beta hydrogen or this one um, will um, initiate the composition and those compounds are not going to be stable uh, the mechanism that i shown above indicated a four center transition state in which the hydride is transferred to the metal. This is a four center transition state. Yep. Now, beta hydride elimination is made possible by the position of. Now, even if you have uh, beta hydrogen attached to your alkyl, um, that decomposition can only be possible. Uh, on two conditions. The first condition is there is a vacant coordination site on the metal. Vac vacant coordination site meaning that there is physically a space for the hydride to attach itself. Here, this metal or that metal must have a vacant physical place for this hydride to attach itself. To make this, if this metal doesn't have any physical uh, space to accommodate this hydride, this is not going to happen. So the condition for that, the first condition for the beta hydride elimination to occur is to have a vacant coordination site on the metal. Therefore, if you want to stop your metal alkyl from undergoing decomposition, you can block all attacks of coordination on the metal. So therefore, you can put bulky groups such as your neopentyl. This is your neopentyl. Oops. You can put bulky group like this, neopentyl or TMSM, trimethyl, silylmethyl. You can put bulky group to block attack on all coordination positions on the metal. On the metal. Thus, 
that blocking will stabilize your metal alkyl despite having beta hydride or beta hydrogen if you block all coordination sites on the metal the uh, decomposition will not occur and this is called stabilizing through steric crowding steric means uh, space crowding means make it crowded so you are making the metal very crowded so hydrogen cannot attack that metal it's just like a, a protection shield so that is the first condition now the second condition for beta hydride elimination to occur and we have to know these conditions because you can strategize how to uh, stabilize the compound the second is there must be a vacant orbital on the metal to interact with the beta, beta uh, hydrogen which is only available in transition metals not in main group metals we know that all transition metals have D orbitals, whereas all non-transition metals like sodium, lithium, magnesium, they don't have D orbitals. So if you want to prevent your metal alkyls from decomposing, do not choose transition metals because transition metals have empty orbital on the metal to accept the electrons from the uh, beta hydrogen. Therefore, Stable main group alkyls containing beta hydrogen, such as the green yard reagent, this one, yep, can be found. So, despite having a beta hydrogen on the uh, ethyl, the green yard reagent, MgBrC2H5, for example, can be quite stable because why? Because the magnesium does not possess any vacant orbital on the metal. So changing your metal from a transition metal to magnesium will affect or will make your metal alkyl uh, very stable. That is why you can have stable green yard reagent. So those are two possible ways uh, that you can uh, carry out to stabilize your metal alkyls that contain beta hydrogen. Yeah, One is through steric crowding. Number two is through changing your metal so that the metal that you use do not have any D orbitals, i.e. vacant orbital. If it only has S or P orbitals, those are likely to be filled with electrons and they're not going to be able to accept electrons from the beta hydrogen. Okay, stable homoleptic alkyls such as um, uh, 4TMSM, uh, chromium, tungsten, uh, Me6, and so on and so forth have been prepared and characterized yeah they have been uh, proven to be stable uh, this one is stable because it doesn't have any beta hydride similarly with this one they don't have beta hydride uh, that is why they can be stable now alkyls are good sigma donors therefore they are capable of stabilizing high oxidation states such as uh, cobalt-4 and cobalt-5. Now, high oxidation state metal have um, uh, less electron density on the metal center because all the electrons, all the D electrons, most of the D electrons have moved through uh, oxidation. So you have a metal center with very much less electrons and very much less electrons uh, will encourage bonding with good sigma donors. Yeah. So good sigma donors can interact very well with electron poor metal centers, whereas good pi acceptors will interact very well with um, metals that have. Uh, low electron, uh, high electron density. Yeah, I'm going to explain that later. 
So that is about metal alkyls. Metal alkyls is for you to deter what what we have discussed for metal alkyls is to uh, to predict the stability of that metal alkyls and how to increase the stability of metal alkyl that contains beta hydrogen. Two. Um, stop beta hydride elimination, elimination of the beta hydrogen, right? So that's about metal alkyl. I'm going to go next into, oh, excuse me, this is not very good. Okay. I'm going to go next into metal aryls. Now, metal aryls are a metal that is attached to one of the carbons in an aromatic um, organic compound. For example, like this, you have your metal attached to this benzene ring, but the point of attachment is on only one particular carbon of that benzene ring. Yep, like this one here. Point of attachment is there, unlike the olefin. If you can still recall olefin, let me scroll up. This is let me scroll up to show you the difference between um, yeah. This is benzene ring acting as an olefin, where the point of attachment is through the pi uh, double bond, the elect pi electron on the double bond to make this uh, situation. This is your benzene ring acting as an olefin, attaching itself to the metal as an olefin where it is counted as a six electron donor. Whereas um, in the case of aryl, hmm, where are you? Yep, in the case of aryl like this, this is a two electron donor instead of six because they do not act as olefin in this case. The phenyl in this case acts as an aryl. Yeah, so this is a two electron donor. Aryl, if you refer to table one, you will find that there is uh, in your selection of uh, um, ligands with two electron donors, one of them is aryl. Yeah, aryl, aromatic ring. Right. Now, metal aryl complexes also tend to be stable because they do not contain beta hydrides. Yeah. If you look at this, this is your metal, that is your alpha carbon, this is your beta carbon, and your. Uh, no, sorry. Yeah, that's your alpha, that is your beta carbon, that is your beta carbon. And there is a hydrogen here. There is a hydrogen in that position. Yep, there is a hydrogen in this position. So despite having beta hydrogen, metal aryls are stable. Yeah. Uh, even if, <laughs> even if they contain beta hydride. Now, even if there are beta hydrogens on the aromatic ligand, metal aryls do not undergo beta elimination decomposition easily because there are two reasons why your um, metal aryls do not undergo decomposition. There you go. Because in order for your beta hydrogen to attack the metal center to initiate the beta hydride decomposition, the hydrogen has to be coplanar. Coplanar means to exist on the same plane as your metal. In order for that to happen, the metal, the alpha carbon, the beta carbon, and the beta hydrogen have to all be coplanar, which is difficult to attain in a ring. In an aromatic ring, this coplanarity is difficult to be achieved because the ring is not as floppy as the chain. Yeah, 
the ring is a little bit more strained compared to the uh, straight chain alky uh, alkyl. So coplanarity of um, beta hydrogen with metal will not happen in a ring. If you can recall, your benzene ring can either be in chair configuration or boat configuration, and they are impossible to make a situation where your beta hydrogen is in the same plane as your metal. So they are going to be distant from the metal. That hopping of electron from the beta hydrogen to metal is not going to happen very easily in metal aryls. Yep, this is the first reason why for metal aryls, decomposition through beta hydride elimination is not going to happen easily despite uh, having beta hydrogens around. The second reason why that is not favored is because when um, beta hydrogen on an aromatic ring uh, attack the metal, that ring is going to lose the hydrogen and losing the hydrogen will destroy the aromatic property, will destroy the aromaticity of that ring. It will destroy aromaticity of the ring, which is not desirable as it compromises the stability of the ring. Because if you can recall, all reactions occur to increase stability. So if stability is reduced, through that reaction, that reaction is not going to be happening. So anything that compromises the stability of the aromatic ring will not be favored. So two reasons why, why your metal aryls are quite stable compared to your metal alkyls. The first one is impossibility, impossible for coplanarity, and number two, destroying of the aromaticity of the ring. Yep. So, aryls, metal aryls are more stable than metal alkyls. The most common aryl that can form complexes with metal metals are phenyls, like I show you below here. You have your phenyl. This is an, a benzene ring attaching a carbon directly to the metal, making it no more a benzene. It's called phenyl now. Yep. Usually, phenyl is given the short form of P, big P and small h. Yeah. Phenyl. You can also have uh, complexes have been uh, having three phenyl and tetrahydrofuran. This is a tetra tetrahydrofuran (THF). You can have this thing happening and so on, and those have been proven to be stable. Another reason for stability of aryl ring is through this resonance. Yeah, you have a, a resonance between this uh, uh, conjugated double ring in this way and another uh, through conjugated double ring in that way. So the existence of this resonance makes the uh, metal aryls very very stable. Now, aryls can accept electrons from metal through pi antibonding back donation, even though it is less effective than carbon monoxide and other neutral pi acid ligand. So, that is about your metal aryls. Now, I'm going to go quickly into um, the next group of Organometallic compounds, here you f we find, um, I've gone through with you, uh, metal to carbon sigma bond, single, single sigma bond. The next one I'm going to go through with you, metal to carbon containing double bond, metal to carbon double bond, um, which are called carbene or alkylidine complexes, yeah? Now, carbene complexes. Now, carbene, uh, let me do this.
Yep. The one in the red box. The, the ligand that I put in the red, red box are called carbene ligand. Similarly, with this. Those are carbene ligands. When they bond to metal, these are called carbene complexes. When this carbene ligand make a bond with metal, they're called carbene complexes, and they make double bond, metal to carbon double bond. Now, and there are, according to um, the structure of the ligand, you can classify carbenes into two different types. One is called the Schrock type carbene. Schrock is the name of a scientist. And another one is called the Fischer type carbene. Now, Fischer is an older chemist compared to Schrock. Schrock is still alive. The, the scientist called Professor Schrock is still alive. The scientist called Fischer is, uh, has gone away, has, has passed away. So we, I'm going to deliver, uh, I'm going to tell you first about your Fisher carbene complexes. Now, Fisher is a scientist in the 1950s. He discovered, um, ferrocene, if you can recall. Uh, he won a Nobel Prize together with Wilkinson in the discovery of ferrocene. So he's working a lot with organometallic compounds and Fisher among his many ligands that he's been working on is the ligand that has this kind of structure. You, he had attached carbon with um, heteroatom. E is any heteroatom, which is oxygen, sulfur, nitrogen, and so on, maybe phosphorus. So he attached um, his carbon carbon with uh, heteroatom, oxygen, sulfur, and nitrogen. And these ligands, he um, complex it with metals. And upon complexation with metal, he discovered these types of uh, complexes where the metal and carbon has double bond. So this was in the um, 1900, about 1950, I really am not that good mathematics. Yep, almost 100 years ago. So he, he called this carbine, carbine, because at this time, IUPAC, International Union of Physical and Applied Chemistry, has not been uh, uh, institutionalized. So the older chemists call this carbene, carbene, yeah? So because Fisher was the first scientist to go into this kind of complexes, these are called the Fisher type carbene complex, yep. Now, this younger scientist called Schrock, younger than Fisher, he uh, may be looking at uh, the Fisher carbene complexes, he said, well, I can do something similar but different. He deferred, he made his ligand different from Fisher in a way that there is no heteroatom on the carbon carbene. Yeah, the difference between Fisher and Schrock type is the absence of heteroatom, oxygen, sulfur, and nitrogen in the Schrock type carbene complex. So Schrock went on and um, produced hundreds of complexes that contains this type of ligand. If you can imagine, R is hundreds. You can start from R equals C1. You can have C2, C3, C4. You can have branched and so on and so forth. You can have um, aromatic ring attached to this. So hundreds of Schrock type carbene complex and hundreds of Fischer type carbene complex. But because Fischer is an older chemist and there was no IUPAC then, 
his type of compound is called the fissure carbene. What a shock, uh, because uh, by this time, IUPAC has been uh, institutionalized. This is called alkylidine, according to the naming convention of um, of uh, organic compounds. So, shrub type carbene complex, now commonly known as alkylidine. So, these are also alkylidine, but this somehow does not get changed because the scientist has passed away. So this scientist that is still alive, Schrock and his group, very, very active group, they sometimes, their compounds are called alkylidine complexes and carbene, uh, Fischer complexes are called carbene complexes. So Fischer is carbene, Schrock is alkylidine. They are exactly the same except for the presence and absence of this um, heteroatom. Uh, so, shrub type carbene are alkylidine. Fischer type carbene complex are this is carbene. Yep. Now, carbene complexes B, this is the B, possess metal carbon double bond and closely related to alkylidine complexes A. Yeah. Alkylidine ligands usually have alkyl substituents on the alpha carbon. Yeah, this is your alpha carbon attached to the metal. Whereas carbene ligands, which is the fissure, have heteroatom substituents as shown above. So your alpha carbon in fissure carbene has heteroatom. Your alpha carbon in shrock alkylidine has no heteroatoms. The ones with the heteroatoms are referred to as fissure. Let me just break this in break, break page. Yep, easier. Yeah. Referred to as Fischer carbines in honor of E.O. Fischer, who reported the first example in 1964. And he later won a Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize for his pioneering work on ferrocene with uh, Jeffrey, Sir Jeffrey Wilkinson. Now, alkylidines, remember alkylidines are shrub type carbine contain only carbon or hydrogen attached to the carbene carbon or the, R, the alpha carbon. It was They were first synthesized several years after the initial fissure carbene complexes, and these have been studied extensively by the Schrock's research group, hence the name Schrock, and several others. Now, there are some distinctions between fissure type carbene complexes and shrub type alkylidine complexes as I summarized below. Yeah, these are your fissure carbene, these are your shrub type alkylidine complexes. Now typically for the metal, metals that are attached to fissure type carbene ligand are middle to late transition metals which has low oxidation state. Low oxidation state means they are rich with electrons because the electrons are still around on the metal. So they are rich with electrons because uh, they're not oxidized and having a heteroatom attached to this um, uh, high electron density on itself will favor high electron density on, on metal will favor bonding to heteroatom because as you know heteroatoms are quite electronegative. They uh, pull electrons towards them so metals that have a lot of electrons will be easily bonded to heteroatoms. That is why you do not get shrub type alkylidine complexes much with uh, high electron density metal. Whereas the shrub type alkylidine complexes have metal with, let me copy this, and make it low. Uh, 
yeah. low electron density of metal. So the Schrock type alkylidine tend to bond easily with early transition metals with high oxidation state. So in terms of metal center, Fischer type uh, carbene attracts metals with high electron density, whereas Schrock type alkylidine attracts um, metals with low electron density. Now, substituents attached to the carbon carbene or the um, alpha carbon for the fissure, at least one highly electronegative heteroatom, such as oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur, whereas for alkylidine, uh, only hydrogen or other alkyls. Typical other ligands attached to the complex because the metals here are high electron density metals, then other ligands that tend to make um, bonding with metal attached to uh, fissure carbene are good pi acceptors because metals have a lot of electrons, so good pi acceptors will be attracted to those metals. Whereas for the Schrock type, good pi or sigma donors uh, type, type of ligands will be attracted to the Schrock type alkylidine complexes. And in terms of electron count, usually the Fischer type carbene have 18 electrons, Bobeda, Ian rule. Why do they obey the Ian rule? Because they have the middle transition metals, whereas the Schrock type usually will not obey, well, tend to disobey the Ian rule because most of them are early transition metals. And early transition metals, as we have learned from previous lecture, um, tend to disobey the 18 electron rule and still be quite stable due to the steric factor. Yeah. So these are um, four of the main differences between Fischer type carbene complexes and Schrock type carbene complexes. No? Right. Fischer carbenes are, well, this is a uh, repeat. Fischer carbenes are typically found on electron-rich, low oxidation state metal complexes containing pi acceptor ligands. The presence of heteroatoms on the alpha carbon allows us to draw a resonance structure that is not possible for an unsubstituted shock type alkylidine. So, when you have a heteroatom here, you will see that there is a cloud of pi electrons uh, covering metal, alpha carbon, and oxygen because there is a, a un, um, unhybridized p orbital there containing lone pair of electrons. Oxygen, for example, has lone pair of electrons. So you have pi electrons covering quite a pi cloud covering quite a huge area on top of your fissure carbene uh, consisting of three atoms, metal, carbon, and that heteroatom. So that lends to very high stability of fissure carbene. But if you can imagine for Schrock, yeah. Now, for Schrock, that doesn't exist. Yep. That heteroatom doesn't exist. Yeah? Now, when that heteroatom doesn't exist, there is no uh, uh, delocalization of pi electrons over beyond this metal. It's only between metal to carbon. So you have a smaller pi electron cloud in Schrock compared to Fischer, making Schrock complexes less stable compared to Fischer complexes. So Schrock alkylidine is less stable than Fischer carbene due to the uh, delocalization of electrons on the 
MCO here. So that is the reason for the extra stability of the fissure cabin. Now, if you look at this, yeah, if you look at this from a molecular or atomic uh, orbital perspective, one lone pair is donated from the carbene carbon to an empty d orbital of the metal, which is red, and a lone pair is back donated from filled metal orbital on the carbon, which is blue, and there is a competition for this vacant orbital uh, by the lone pair of heteroatom here at the top, consistent with our second resonance structure. Overall, the bonding closely resembles that of mo carbon monoxide. Therefore, carbene ligands are usually thought of as new, uh, neutral species. Yeah, Carbene has no charge, but Schrock alkylidine has a charge of minus two. Now, Fischer-type carbene complexes are more stable than its Schrock-type counterpart, for example, CrCO5, C, OCH3, C6H5. Now, here is, you can immediately recognize this. You can immediately recognize that as Fischer, because of that presence of oxygen there, is more stable than this Schrock. Yeah. The stability is due to the presence of highly electronegative atom, like I explained to you. Oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur attach, making a delocalized three-atom pi system involving metal, carbon, and electronegative atom. So you have this happening. Single crystal X-ray diffraction studies confirm that the second resonance for a form shown above plays a major role in describing the bonding in metal carbene complexes. The, the metal double bond, metal double bond, double, double bond carbon, yeah, tend to be longer and, than a typical metal to carbon double bond, but shorter than metal to carbon single bond. Yeah, these are the uh, structures that have been um, discovered. So I'm going to stop there. This is 47 minutes. I'm going to stop there for lecture number eight. Yep. Um, and I'm going to continue uh, in my lecture number 10 on metal to carbon triple bond. If carbene is metal to carbon double bond, I'm going to go into metal to carbon triple bond. So that's it. I'm going to continue in my next lecture. And um, thank you. Assalamu alaikum.